So we don't realize that there's a choice. We think like, oh, I gotta, I gotta just help them right now, right? I can't stand seeing my friend in pain. I wanna help them. That's you projecting that your friend needs your help. While we truly treasure fostering deep connections with the people in our lives, sometimes navigating those spaces between culture, listening, emotion, thought, and expression can feel so, I don't know, tricky, daunting even. It turns out that the art of communication and connection are learnable. And today's guests are big advocates for sharing this knowledge with others. They're paving the path to learning a new way of connection. CEO Stephanie Tran and instructor Norman Tran are the co-founders of Relating Between the Lines, an Asian-founded school for relational education. Through RBTL's corporate workshops and month-long cohorts with young working professionals, Stephanie and Norman have helped hundreds of people show up in their relationships with greater presence, listening skills, and emotional intelligence. By empowering people with tools to identify and express their feelings and needs, Stephanie Norman and their RBTL team are enabling them to show up as fuller versions of themselves, leading to stronger relationships and a stronger sense of self. So please welcome to the Asian Boss Girl podcast, Stephanie and Norman. Hi, welcome. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you, Janet and Helen, for that beautiful intro. Um, That was really sweet and such a great, like, summary of what we do at RBTL. No, thank you so much for being on our podcast today. Um, We would love to start off this episode by having you take us all the way back to when you were kids. Let's start off with that. Because having a company that fosters emotional intelligence and human connection that takes experience, you know? So give us a picture of what young Stephanie and young Norman were like. Helen, that is such a great question. <laughs> and so, man, when I think about when I was a kid, I think the first thing that comes to mind is as a kid, I really loved doing arts and crafts. And so I was very much that like origami sort of girl. Um, I would build stuff out of like, paper I was also that person you want anything built I'll build it for you but like out of paper (laughs) um, as a kid and I think I was also um, I would say like creative um, and artistic and so I wrote poetry I'm not saying it was good poetry but I did write poetry Um, and I also was a very like feelsy and emotional um, child and so I'm a cancer and so um, cancer girly does cancer things so I did write love letters I don't know what I was doing writing love letters to like this five-year-old Randy in the back of the classroom and like hiding in my yearbook but it was definitely that type of thing Um, and so I really felt a lot and I think um, you know on a more like serious note like Um, In middle school and high school, I I really became that person that was sort of like a support person, like some people's rock, basically, and really listened to a lot of people's um, challenging experiences, mental health um, challenges and like relationship challenges. And so I think that while I didn't necessarily experience the things other people experienced, I think I did get a better sense of like the the human experience, I think, through listening to other people's experiences. And so I think that that did lead to sort of this development of like, you know, emotional maturity, like throughout my um, like early years. And so that that's my story. This is why we vibe. We are both creative <laughs> cancers. I was kind of like the uncontainable kid and I always love like the idea of coloring outside the lines which is very much like the ethos that we have at our retail now but I'd say like in terms of like how does that connect with my eventual work I used to love collecting Pokemon and like Yu-Gi-Oh cards and somehow as an adult I loved collecting frameworks and so it became like a nerdy version of that and so a lot of what like RBTL is is a collection of, I think, the best practices for communicating. Mm. And both Stephanie and I love sharing that knowledge in a fun, interesting way. I love that. Is there a point that you feel like you've reached some level of, um, not some level, but that you've reached emotional maturity? I mean, to start a whole company based on feelings and connection, do you feel like you've reached 
peak emotional maturity at a certain age? Or is this something that is just ongoing and always developing for the both of you? I honestly think that there's no ending, <laughs> I think, to to the emotional maturity. I think there's a point where in, in this journey, I think it starts with a lot of like awareness. Um, and then there's a point where you translate that awareness into actual like action and what you do. And I think that um, you know, I can't speak for, for Norman, but for myself, I think there's a point where the awareness is translating into like how I communicate, how I show up in my relationships. And I think that's how I knew, okay, like there's something to what I'm doing that I think like can be learned or taught. Um, and I give credit to a lot of like how Norman's um, sort of arranged um, the information in order for me to actually like learn this stuff. And so, um, no, I don't think there's a peak but I think there's a point uh, in the journey where you realize like, oh, th- these things are actionable. These things are things that I can learn to actually evolve. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that's where kind of RBTL comes into the picture. How did you two even meet each other? Your, your, both your last names are Tran. And I don't I don't want to assume <laughs> that there's a, a, a relation <laughs> here, relatedness here. But how did you both meet? To answer the question of whether or not we're related, we are definitely not. Um, Norman and I like, Norman and I like to call each other work wifeys. Um, and work wives, we, we know that, all yeah, about that. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, and I think I, I've had like past uh, clients and students be like, oh, and you know, your your husband. I was like, what? Like, that, that's not my husband. And, and he's like, oh, your brother, Norman. I was like, no, 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 no. Like, we're, we're like very far from related. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's like a hilarious like thing that people always comment on. Um, but in terms of like how we met and and ended up being like co-founders, um, there has to be a little bit of background between me and Norman before we sort of like get to that point. Um, but I think for me, like my my personal journey is um, I've always been a very relational like person. Um, I've always been um, people and people facing roles. So like something of interest to me is like working really well with people, understanding how people work and bringing out the best um, in people. And I think I was. I always had an entrepreneurial spirit as well. And so like that, that little girl that was like creating stuff out of paper, like literally out of nothing, like that energy, energy is still like here and very much alive. And so, um, back in 2019, I actually founded a, um, different company for fitness and it's called Power Wolf Athletics. And, um, the mission was to bridge mental and physical health. Um, and so when I was working through that company, I was coaching hundreds of people and what I was doing was really helping people feel safe enough to unpack what was difficult for them, what was blocking them to consistently being able to like work out. And when I left, um, and I, when I was deciding what was next, I, what I knew was like, I wanted to make sure my next venture had people focused things like elements. Um, and also that second thing that I knew I wanted was I love taking ideas and making them come alive. Like it's that like entrepreneurial spirit. This is where Norman comes into the picture. So in my journey, um, before I left, I was actually working on programming that would enhance people's lives like outside of fitness. So it was think like financial literacy, think like communication. And so there was a lot of interest from my past clients in EQ work. And at this point, this is when one of my um, best friends and now husband um, suggested for me to work with Norman. Um, and because he's been teaching a lot of this stuff for years. And so um, I want to pass it over to you, Norman, so that you can share a little bit more uh, context on like how yeah. um, your, your story is. I love this journey and story so much because it's so random and serendipitous. Yeah. So I was a client of Power Wolf. Uh, Kevin introduced me to the program and I went through it and it was delightful and powerful and connecting. And when Steph told me she was exploring additional programming after her original course, she reached out to me and said, hey, want to potentially teach the stuff that you teach? I was like, sure, let's talk about it. At the time, I had been prototyping a card game for several years that was basically like cards with humanity. And it was my attempt of like, how can I take emotional intelligence and like Trojan horse those skills into a card game for people to learn? I prototyped one version of the card game with the Powerwolf team one evening 
over like Korean barbecue or something. And that night something magical happened. There was this like collective like understanding that like, oh my God, like there's something here. This, this body of work, whatever it is, this form, there's something really powerful about it. Fast forward to 2020 when Stephanie left, she reached out again and said, hey, let's actually like build something. And so she's like, oh, your card game, it's not finished. Let's finish it. Let's just, <laughs> let's just like get it out there. And that's really like how it was born. And before that, the reason why the card game even like was a thing was because in 2016, I was one of the youngest facilitators for Stanford's very famous touchy-feely class. Um, it's more formally known as interpersonal dynamics, but it's basically where like MBA students go to learn about emotions and how it mm. can help with influence and connection. I was a facilitator for that, and I was like, wow, I love this work. It's so powerful, but why is it only available to Stanford students? Who's going to be able to pay 200K <laughs> for an MBA to get this education? So there's a desire to be able to share this with more people but also like being that like wacky creative kid i was like this is also so serious so formal and so hetero like i want to queer eye this and make it more fun and light right not to dismiss the, the importance of depth but like there's a different way of doing this and so the card game was a many year exploration of how could we make the teaching of relational intelligence fun and digestible. And so in 2020, mm. Steph was this fairy godmother of operations and was just like, let's bring it to life. And so it shall be. And that's <laughs> how the company started. The, the card game became the course. The card game became the experience. Oh, okay. We all need a friend like that, like Steph in our lives that just kicks us in the butt and says, this passion project of yours that is lying dormant, we got to bring this to life because everyone has to play this. Everyone has to try this out. Did it actually become a card game or were the prompts on the cards used for the courses? So the cards became the curriculum, Mm. but every student that goes through the live version of the course, we send them a gift package and oh. the way that you learn it is every module you unlock new cards that's just the starting point there's a lot more like real time trying different things and improv that doesn't quite feel like it can fit inside a card so mm-hmm. there's definitely i think something beautiful about having something tangible but there's also these like unique experiences as a layer mm-hmm. on top of the cards Yeah. So tell us more about relating between the lines then. How would you summarize RBTL's mission to our listeners? So I think ultimately RBTL is trying to interrupt generational patterns where relationships were not the focus. Your quality of life is really determined by the quality of relationships. And so to bring a re-emphasis on relationships has a really, I think, powerful effect on culture like imagine what it would be like to grow up where your parents modeled boundaries affirming authentic expression like what (laughs) like i know that's not what my parents modeled for me but what if we could be the next generation that modeled that for let's say our kids or like our friends kids etc i was gonna add i think Um, On a more personal note, I think being Asian American, being a daughter of like refugees, like my parents are both people from Vietnam, being a woman, being a middle child, um, I think I grew up very much conditioned to be um, very hyper independent. Um, and you know, which meant doing things by myself, not really asking for help, suffering in silence. And I think I can imagine listeners being, you know, can, can relate to this, this idea of like being told not to cry and like being made to believe growing up that feelings are really bad. And, and that ultimately leads so much, so many of us to feel, I think, afraid to be vulnerable. Um, and I think because of 
Um, I know at least for my parents, like needing to conform and, you know, just, just to survive, like ma- made it, I think, difficult for me as a child to feel like it was okay to take up space and to speak up for what you need and made me very, very afraid of conflict and very conflict averse. Um, and so like on the one hand, really thinking, you know, all of our parents for their sacrifices and how they did their very best. And also recognizing at the same time, it coexists with the fact that like these characteristics make it very difficult to, I think, thrive emotionally in relationships. And so I think underneath that mission of helping us pass down more healthier patterns of relating, I think underneath that is really just like, how do we help people feel comfortable being seen feeling our feelings, taking up space, self-advocacy, like letting others see and and really care for you um, and to fully receive love and to give love um, and to not be afraid of like conflict and seeing it as a source of connection. I think all those things are, are part of that like human experience that we're trying to, um, you know, really bring to the surface and make it more um, available and give people the opportunity to gain confidence in being able to approach these types of situations. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, both of your experiences and, and the history that you've shared, you know, as, as you're sharing your stories, I'm like nodding along and understanding because I'm also, you know, a daughter of immigrants and uh, can very much vouch for the experience of feeling maybe that emotions um, are hard to experience and we're not always taught that I was not always like guided around that. Um, and so it's beautiful that you've created a company and experience around that mission. Uh, getting deeper and, and more specific into how you make this happen with RBTL, can you share with us, um, you know, how you define, I guess, healthy and effective communication? And what is it about RBTL's approach that is different than, say, what someone could get out of a self-help book or, you know, another organization? Healthy communication is easy to explain, extremely hard (laughs) to master. It really boils down to balancing two qualities. Are you direct and are you caring? Everything we teach in RBTL is helping someone on one side or the other move towards the other side for balance. So if you're direct but not caring, you're an asshole. If you are caring but not direct, you're beating around the bush and it's hard to know what you're saying. When you're direct and caring, you're assertive and connecting. And so everything that we teach is really measured against those two qualities to help people understand how powerful it can be to be more direct and how powerful it can be to be more caring or to infuse more care into your communication. We take all this material that's out there and we actually synthesize it. A lot of other places, they'll give you a list of things. They'll curate, but not synthesize. And even after you've synthesized it, how do you turn this abstract blob of stuff called communication and emotions and relationships and make it learnable? And so if you look at the cards that we use in the class, there are these like little tiny step-by-step guides for the smallest little thing like asking a question, reflecting back so that you're helping the other person feel seen, to how do you check in with yourself? How do you even share about yourself? I think when we think of things like communication, it's often unspecific, right? What, what do you do? Just be vulnerable, right? Like we get that so much. Just be vulnerable. Just take a risk. Just, just be with your emotions. But what does that mean? So if any of you have ever like had a really bad dance teacher, that's just like, just follow me. Just like, just, you know, <laughs> you know, just follow the groove. And you're like, what do I do with my left leg? What, what angle? Like, am I moving it at the same time as like my right arm? Like, what about my shoulder? There's a lot of granularity that you have to pay attention to to teach well. So even for something as simple as asking a question, right? We break it down to like, what are the different parts of a question? Where could you infuse more of that care so that it lands differently? Let's say that's the biggest 
differentiator is that it's specific, easy to follow, and it's super fun. People come into class like a, at like a 4 out of 10 in terms of their energy and mood, and they leave at an 8 out of 10. It's kind of magical. It's an experience as much as it is a skill set. That should go on a t-shirt. <laughs> experience as much as a skill set. Um, yeah, I mean, everything that you've been describing, that is definitely something that um, I think I personally, as someone who has uh, been a bit of a self-help book junkie for periods of my life, understand very much that struggle of, yeah, this is cool. I'm learning a lot. But then like, how do I use it? Or like that, there's that missing piece. So creating an experience around it really helps to um, make it applicable and make it actionable. All of these things are so conceptual. And like, yes, you can read all the books you want, but until you're actually practicing it live, until you like flop, until you like mess up and like make mistakes, it doesn't become real and it doesn't become part of like what you do. So it's kind of like that whole fitness thing where you can read about all the things that it'll take to, um, you know, uh, be, be more fit and be more healthy but until you actually do it it doesn't actually mean much for you like and it doesn't actually amount to much like in your life and so I think that the facilitators and wanting to really shout out the team because um, they do an incredible job at being really healthy role models for like how these skills sort of come to, into play they um help people and create an environment for feeling safety and supported and a lot of understanding because a lot of this stuff is really confronting. Um, and I think what we're trying to do is actually rewire our nervous system to um, react in like a different like way. Um, and that requires practice and that requires feeling okay and safe enough to like make mistakes um, in order to learn. And so really wanting to like shout out the team here because without them, like they, we wouldn't be able to like help as many people um, as we actually do. And I think that they um, are the vision and they make people see what's possible like in their relationships. How large are um, are the teams usually or how, how large are the cohorts and, and are yeah. you sort of practicing this in front of other, um, I guess, students or people who are interested in taking RBTL or are they doing it like as a one-on-one? What's like yeah. the format of all of this? That's a great question. So our team, uh, we have our two senior facilitators, Kevin, um, who my husband and like, um, I know it's so funny. Um, and um, my other best friend, Jiggy, um, who's a youth mental health, like motivational speaker. So there's our um, senior facilitators. And then we have a total of, I think, like six um, additional facilitators in the team. And so when you um, participate in RBTL, it's like a live experience. And so you're doing it in a group because that's the only way to really like learn. Um, and our facilitators like guide you through um, this experience. They give you feedback. Um, Norman, did you want to share about like how the, the immersion like sessions work? Immersions are usually groups of anywhere from like four to six ish. And you have two facilitators. Imagine you're like sitting in a circle and you're taking turns playing the card game where you're taking turns answering different levels of questions from like cozy to stretch to daring. And then after you answer a question, other students will use the practices on you. So everyone gets a chance to share a little bit and have other people respond to them using the practices. And then everyone gets a chance to use the practices on other people. So it ends up being this almost like sandbox for trying on these new ways of communicating. And because it's live, you are getting real-time feedback and real-time data. Like, oh, the way you said that actually was connecting, cool. Or, oh God, that was a complete flop. Let me try that again. And so you're getting real-time information about the way that you're showing up. And that's invaluable because we rarely get that kind of feedback in the real world. Who's gonna tell you like, mm -hmm. you know the way you just asked that question made me feel really connected to you. Just letting you know. <laughs> like you're not gonna get mm -hmm. that kind of feedback usually, but this is the place where we basically take a microscope to that type of meta interaction and study our patterns and dissect it in real time. Sounds like a very safe space to try on these more difficult conversations that you might you know, wanna shy away from in real mm -hmm. life. 
Yeah, that's awesome. The hope with RBTL um, and taking the courses and being part of the the cohort and the sessions is to really have this transformative experience then, is to become better at communicating, walk away feeling empowered with tools to express yourself better, which is amazing that that is something that that you guys are, are both providing here. From what you've seen in your work, how long does it usually take to get better at communicating for someone who's starting day one how long is that process for them to be like confident in it mileage will vary depending on how much you actually try the material in your life right we have students that will like go to the class and then be like no i didn't apply it i'm scared and then there's students that are like trying it all the time and like failing and then getting better even in just one session people are starting to see things differently oh, I didn't know I could say that. Oh, I didn't know I could feel that. Oh, I didn't know I could think that. So that's already like creating a new um, fertileness in your life for your relationships to begin improving. I'd say after one week, you start being less reactive. So your patterns that you used to go into, like, I want to give you advice. Wait, I'm not going to do that. I know that's not what you need. Sorry. Right. You, you, you stop yourself from doing the things that you used to do because we focus a lot, not just on what you should do, but also what to avoid to really complete the picture. I'd say after one cohort, you will start having much more engaging relationships to begin with because you've been trying these behaviors with different people in your life. You're affirming people that you usually don't affirm. You're asking people to connect with you in ways that you haven't done before. You're stepping into harder conversations which become opportunities for improved understanding of each other so if you're doing the work within one cohort you will already start seeing change in terms of like feeling confident i'd say it reasonably takes a year so something we do in our program is we allow people to re-enroll depending on the tier that they select and a lot of people come back to that second round, that third round to deepen the practice because it's ongoing work like we talked about in the beginning. There's no like destination, but we have like follow-up programs after the actual RBTL experience just for people that are like really trying to become masters or even like trying to become facilitators. So I'd say mastery would take one year plus, but even within the duration of one cohort, your relationships will start improving. Wow, that is an incredible tool. I don't know if there's any class that I could sign up where after <laughs> after one session, I could see an improvement in all of my relationships in my life. I think that's just so powerful. And it makes me think of, you know, we speak a lot about um, the importance of, of communication and being able to talk about your feelings often in like one-on-one settings with like therapy. But when you talk about something that's like a, a class and a practice done in a group setting, um, I can only imagine how incredibly powerful that is. In the past month, I've complimented two separate friends on their outfits, seriously wanting one of their sweater tops and the other's new boots. And when I asked them where they got them, both answered Stitch Fix. I shopped with Stitch Fix in the past and found some great staple items. I've been loving their freestyle option where you can select and shop pieces on your own. Or if you'd like some style assistance, they can pair you with a stylist who will learn about your tastes and collaborate with you on looks, which is how I found one of my favorite pair of vegan black boots a couple of years ago. They have over 1,000 brands and styles to choose from and a wide range of sizes for all body types, from XS to 3XL. With Stitch Fix, there's no subscription required. Simply order a refresh as needed or set it and forget it with regular seasonal fixes. Shipping, returns, and exchanges are always free. Try Stitch Fix today at stitchfix.com abg and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That's stitchfix.com slash ABG for 25% off today. Stitchfix.com slash ABG. If you could share a little bit about um, how RBTL might apply to different areas of your life. I know that there are, you know, in the realm of relationships, there are romantic relationships, there are parental and child relationships, and there are work relationships. 
Um, what are some ways that you've seen the exercises and the applications that you use at RBTL have an influence in these sectors? I actually interview everyone who comes into the program. And so every time I, I talk to people, like at, at the beginning, at the end, they're always just like, God, I wish I had this yesterday. Like we've had people who um, are you know, in their 40s and 50s and 60s who are just like, oh my God, like y'all who are getting this in your 20s, like you're, you're, we're, you're so lucky. Um, and so in terms of like the um, relationships, I think I, I think the best way to explain that is to go into sort of like maybe some examples of um, some um, changes that we have seen. I know for me personally, um, uh, something that really triggered a lot of this work, which I'm sure is is relevant to a lot of people, is just like my love life and thinking about like romantic relationships and thinking about, you know, life planning um, and thinking about kids in the future. And I was in a long term relationship that didn't end up working out and I didn't actually understand what was happening in the relationship. I was just like, OK, something doesn't feel right, but I couldn't pin it. Um, and I realized like, oh, this person is not saying what they need. This person is withholding like information from me. I don't feel comfortable sharing like X, Y, and Z. Um, and so there's a lot of like different pieces you start to see and you start to understand the dynamics of your relationship. Um, and, you know, fast forward coming out of that relationship and being in this new one, um, you know, having somebody who also understands these skill sets, um, this is the first time in my life where relationship is not the biggest problem that I like have, which is like such a relief. Like if you think about it, you and your partner, somebody that you're supposed to be or you would want to be for the rest of be with the rest of your life, you're going to go through a lot together. And so I think these skills make it so that we can work through conflict. We can have hard conversations and um, talk about sensitive things like money, talk about taking care of in-laws when they get older, talking about how much it's going to take to raise a child. And those things can be really difficult when you don't have that foundational like skills. Um, not saying you can't go through it, but it's a lot of trial and error um, if you don't have like the skills. And so I think that's how it's relevant personally for like a romantic relationship. Um, and I know that Norman also has done a lot of work with his parents um, and so Norman, maybe you can share a little bit more about that and then we can talk about work. One relationship I've constantly been working on is with my dad. So this man is so stoic. He'll laugh and that's about it. <laughs> like you won't get much other emotions from him. He'll, he'll show mad, but like, that's all he's got. You know, not, not, he doesn't have a lot of range. Growing up, I really didn't feel connected to him in the way that I feel like connected to my mom. He's very functional. His love language is basically like sacrifice, acts of service. He does a lot for me, but he never shows the love. And so when I learned these skills, I got a chance to change the dynamic where I get to lead him into my world and share with him this very foreign world uh, with him. And so being the first person to be like, dad, I went on a really bad date and I'm really sad right now. Can you give me a hug? Like I never would have like been able to do that years ago if I didn't, you know, like have th this kind of body of work front and center in my mind. And so being able to do that and getting a hug from my dad, even if it was a little awkward, was one of the most like healing things for me and him. I now have the agency to improve and invest in my relationship with him. I'm not gonna wait until like he's on his deathbed and then like both of us are having regrets that we didn't try to improve this relationship just because we didn't have a good starting point. Uh, I now explain to him what does it mean for me to be neurodivergent. I send him like articles and stuff about ADHD and giftedness and he sits there and like digests it and has a dialogue with me. So this ability to invite connection into my life, even if it's terrifying and to be honest, like it doesn't, it's not like 100% smooth. There are times where he's like, what do you expect from me? <laughs> I'm not Stephanie. He's like, literally said that before. And I'm like, you're right. <laughs> like I can't expect you to give the kind of connection that I get to experience with Stephanie, but I can try. And so being able to have like a menu of things I can try and ask for with someone else, even if it doesn't work 100% of the time, 
is life changing. Wow, thank you for sharing that. That was incredibly powerful. Um, and I know that a lot of our listeners and viewers share, you know, probably as you were describing your father, I'm sure many people are nodding along and understanding how difficult some of those types of relationships can be to navigate. Um, so it's really beautiful to hear that through some of these like different, I guess, this guidance and the framework that you're able to have the, the courage and, and also the, the ability to connect with him. Um, I know, Stephanie, you are also going to share about potentially outside of family relationships and romantic, how this is so broad it could apply to like workplace relationships as well. Yeah, definitely. So I think, you know, I, I love hearing from people when they say like, you know, I'm coming in working on a relationship with my um, parent and then they go to work and the next week they're just like, and then I used it with like my, my uh, direct report and it was great. And so I think there's Things like, you know, when we think about work, I think we we think about just, you know, things that need to be done, like the tasks at hand. And we forget that we're working with other human beings and other people. And when we think about, um, you know, applying the skills to say, like, if you're a manager and you're guiding people, you know, how do you help affirm people so that they feel seen in what they do? How do you help mirror what you're seeing when they're like struggling Right. Um, how do you ask the right questions um, and how do you model um, expression? Like, how do you model like speaking up and asking for your needs? Let's just say you um, also want to manage up. Right. And we're thinking about how do you speak up for what it is that you need at work? Like then it becomes very relevant. I think some some folks like may want to sort of have a deeper relationship with the people around them. And you can only do that when you take chances in sharing yourself, expressing yourself. Um, there's also the case of setting boundaries and being like, hey, you know, that that honestly doesn't really work for me. Let's let's find a different way of working. Not to mention these skills become super relevant when you're talking about conflict and when you're talking about how to show up and how to make sure both parties still have a win-win situation, um, even though you're not feeling like your best, like especially in conflict. So having the confidence to do that too um, is so relevant in the workplace. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, do you have any stories of um, any personal anecdotes from any members of your cohorts who have, um, have gone through these practices? Any transformative stories that really stand out to you? Yeah, um, so uh, I host a podcast that's called Humans of RBTL that goes like deep dives into like everyone's story, but I can quickly share a few that come like top of mind. Um, I think the first ones um, that come to mind for me is we've had couples that have taken it, like one person takes it and then the other person takes it the second cohort. And we've had people share that they're so glad they took it because it's like really supported their like marriage or their relationship. We've had couples who have taken it um, together actually at the same time and have shared that it's like helped them connect more deeply. Um, we've had people who realize like, actually, like this is not quite the right relationship for me and like really make that difficult choice of like walking away. Um, we've had um, one of our facilitators, which who's so like wonderful, Vicky, she's um, shared how she's developed a deeper relationship with her brother. Like there are things that she wasn't able to share before that she's able to share now, um, as well as with her mom. Um, and she's somebody who has typically been the person that sort of is in the passenger seat, doesn't like share as much of herself, sort of is the person that's there for everyone else. And she's really evolved into being somebody who can really like take up like that space and share more of herself. We've we've had like guys also come into the program, like best friends that just like really love like being able to connect more deeply like with each other as well. Like they come in for like the skills and the communication, but at the end of the day, like all of them comment on like how much their quality of life is just so much better. Um, and I think that's a direct um, correlation between like your relationships and, and the quality of them um, having an impact on like um, your life as a whole. And so I think this is one of those things like, um, you know, that 80, 20, like if you just like focus on this one thing, it can really bring so much, um, lightness, so much joy, like into everything else. And so that's like the common thread that I hear from a lot of folks who come into the community. That's so beautiful. I love hearing, um, that, you know, 
that people are getting something out of this and it's like a lifelong skill that you can use and it's not just something that's temporary. You don't take a class and you learn something and forget it like I did with my U.S. history AP class. <laughs> this you can take with you forever. Um, so for all of our listeners out there, we will be hosting a workshop session with the our BTL team for our Discord community in September. So everyone out there, keep your eye out for that. But for now, could you, Norman and Stephanie, stimulate a quick practice exercise on this episode? Is there an activity or exercise that you could share with our listeners that based on past experience, can have an immediate impact with immediate results, which I know is a lot to ask for. <laughs> a big, a tall order. <laughs> yes, but a quick exercise that we and our listeners can can do right now. The way we structure our class is we have four different modules, each one with a different theme. I'm going to give a teaser to one of the themes and then introduce a technique, a very simple technique, that you can use literally today. So one of the mindsets that we teach is called supporting over solving. A lot of us think that to be a good listener, you have to be helpful. You have to be useful. You have to be someone who says smart things. And so that gets in the way of your listening because you're not listening anymore to the person. You're trying to give advice. You're like, did you read that New York Times bestseller? Did you read this? Have you heard of this podcast? Oh, I've tried that. I think it's going to really help you. Like all of that stuff is actually not what people are often looking for. Mm-hmm. So to be a supportive listener, by contrast, is to listen with no agenda. To listen in a way that is like letting them pour whatever they want out of a cup and just keep pouring until it's empty. Just, just let it all out. And so one technique that's very simple to help you shift from being a sneaky problem solver to a more supportive listener is asking someone else this question. Would it be more helpful for me to listen or would you like for me to help you solve this problem? So we don't realize that there's a choice. We think like, oh, I gotta, I gotta just help them right now. Right? I can't stand seeing my friend in pain. I wanna help them. That's you projecting that your friend needs your help. Instead of jumping to conclusions, jumping to being a savior, ask them, what do you need, right? So you can ask, what do you need? You can ask, is it more helpful to just empathize with you or to help you problem solve? That distinction frees up a lot of your bandwidth. So you're not wondering, what do I say? What's gonna be helpful? You're just able to just be with them. And for them, it allows them to have their own agency in deciding what do they actually need? So that question is so powerful because it frees up both of you and allows both of you to actually be in a more connecting, present space. Thank you for sharing that. Actually, that reminds reminds me of a couple of conversations I've had uh, with friends. And um, I know that I am that person that has a tendency to want to solve problems for people um, because, you know, it's it's sometimes hard to to have people that you love come to you and share things that are uncomfortable or to see them hurt. Um, but I think it's really powerful to be able to take the pressure off yourself and also to give that person the power to um, ask for what they want. So I think that's a great simulation. I would definitely encourage all of our viewers, our listeners, like the next conversation that you have with someone where there's a difficult situation, try to use that question instead of like solving. And I'm, I know I'm going to definitely do that as well. <laughs> um, so thank you for sharing that, Norman and Stephanie. Um, to wrap us up today... We are wondering for our listeners if they take away just one thing from this episode because we've talked about some really significant um, significant and, and big things. What is the thing that they should take away? Oh, this is, I think this is an even taller order. <laughs> 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 what, one thing to take away. Uh, gosh, a lot of this work, I think, at the end of the day, stems from starting with awareness of how you feel. Um, and so if there's something, you know, I think a lot of people listening can, can feel the anxiety of like, oh my God, like, I really want to work on this stuff, but like, I feel like I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm starting like at ground zero, you know, or like, I feel like I'm behind, I think is like what a lot of people feel when they start this journey. And so I think if I were to share one um, tip, it would just be to allow for your feelings to come up. 
Um, like you don't even have to identify. Just just like let it like come up and and don't try to figure it out. Um, and then just know that there that there is a pathway after. So it goes from awareness to like you know identifying those feelings and then translating them into needs and then like asking for. But it starts with being on this side first. And the sooner that you can um, practice that, the easier the rest of the things will be. And obviously we can help with like all those other things too. Cool. And how can our listeners connect with you all? That is also a great question. If you're ready, <laughs> if you want to start learning, um, we have our self-guided course, um, which you can find on our website. Um, we also have um, a lot of like our alumni stories, um, as well as our newsletter that Norman writes. Um, and you can find all of that and um, join our newsletter directly on our website. Um, on Instagram, you can find Relating Between the Lines at Relating Between the Lines. <laughs> Personal like Instagrams for me is at Shades of Steph with two H's. Yeah, I'm more of a Twitter guy. Yeah, um, Twitter guy. <laughs> so you can find me at Norman underscore Trang. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Norman and Stephanie, for being being here with us today and sharing with us just a little bit about Relating Between the Lines. For our listeners, if you want to get more from this, we will be hosting a session on our Discord channel. So please keep an eye out uh, for details around that and you'll get to experience for yourself what Norman and Steph have shared with us today. Um, thanks again, Norman and Steph. Uh, and with that, we will catch you all in the next episode. Bye. Bye.